Hello, my name is Michelle Ponta and welcome to KAUS Live. Today my guest is Catherine McFadden. Catherine is a professor of biology at Harvey Mudd College in Claremont, California, and she's here today as part of our fall enrichment program. Catherine, thank you, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. So you're a biologist, but you specialize in coral reefs, and specifically you focus on the species problem in the coral. What exactly is the species problem? What's well, the species problem? Okay. Um, so uh, corals are a, a quite a well-known group, a very kind of conspicuous group. Um, they're what you see when you go out on the reef, and um, the uh, like most other. Um, all other organisms, over time we've described them and we've given them names and we've recognized different, different species. Um, and much of our understanding of how coral reefs function um, is based on the species that are there, the biodiversity, um, and how those species interact with one another. What we've been learning over time is that our understanding of what those species are is not what we thought it was. <laughs> so um, the way species have been described historically for about the last 300 years is based on what they look like. Um, so we consider things that look sufficiently different from one another to be different species, things that look very similar to one another we consider to be the same species. Um, but what we've been learning really over the last three decades or, decades or so as we've been able to look at um, organisms genetically actually look at their DNA and the, the genes that um, they carry uh, is that our understanding of different species based on what they look like is very flawed. So we have um, cases where what we thought was one species, very common, widespread on coral reefs throughout the Indo-Pacific, we've now learned from um, genetic data maybe four or five different species all living in different areas. It's not one species as we thought. We also have the, uh, the flip side of that, which is in some cases things we thought were different species because they look different. From the genetics, we've now learned that they're actually all the same and they're just variations of the same species. So this is really what we've been referring to as the species problem, is that uh, our understanding of what is a species of coral and how do we tell those species apart um, is, is very flawed. Um, and uh, uh, this um, uh, really impacts our ability, our, our understanding of what species occur where, what's on a local reef, whether it's the same thing you find here versus other parts of the Indo-Pacific, and how really how these coral reefs function. Okay, so basically what you see isn't always what you get when you're, when you're looking at species in the corals. Exactly, right. Um, and we refer to these as cryptic species, so you know, cryptic uh, is a word that typically means hidden or confusing. Um, and uh, there's different ways that organisms can be cryptic. So we also refer to cryptic organisms as things that live deep within the reef that are hidden we don't see. But this other use of the term cryptic has been applied to species that we, we simply can't tell apart. Um, or at least initially, we didn't realize we're different species because they look so similar. So cryptic species look alike, essentially. Okay. So the cryptic biodiversity of the reefs is what you're going to be talking about today at, uh, at 12.30. That's right, yeah. yes. Yeah. Why is it important to identify all these different species and classify them as different or the same? Why, why is this so important? Um, again, I think uh, our, our understanding of how coral reefs function um, and how they uh, change over time um, is, is really a function of what species are there and how those individual species are responding to the environment and to the other um, both the physical environment and the biological environment around them. So to give you just a, a couple of examples um, of cases where I think our, our understanding of how those reefs function and how our actions may impact reefs, particularly locally, um, several of the examples I'll talk about in my talk later involve species from the Red Sea. In one case, a, a species of reef building coral that's uh, considered to be very common widespread as a range from the Red Sea, Southern Indian Ocean, all the way across to the Western Pacific. And an awful lot of research has been done on it, particularly here in the Red Sea, understanding its, its physiology, its um, uh, response to environmental conditions, all, all sorts of aspects of its biology. And I think we've assumed that 
what we've learned from studying it here in the Red Sea can be applied throughout its entire Indo-Pacific range and also um, so from understanding what's here in the Red Sea, we can understand how this same coral functions in the Western Pacific. We've now learned recently from uh, again, genetic work that what's here in the Red Sea is actually a unique species and appears to be genetically quite different from what has been called the same thing in the Western Pacific. So now um, all of our understanding of this, this species is still applicable to, to what occurs in the Red Sea, but perhaps not to what's occurring in the Western Pacific or the Southern um, Indian Ocean. Uh, another example that's, that's um, much of what I have focused on in my own research is, um, again, many species were originally described from the Red Sea. We, people have been working in the Red Sea on coral reefs longer than, than anywhere else. And many corals, both reef building corals and uh, other types of corals, were first described and named here in the Red Sea. And then other, those names have been applied throughout the Indo-Pacific. So if people have found corals that look very similar in other parts of the Indo-Pacific, they've assumed it's all the same as what was first found here in the Red Sea. Uh, my work and also work of, of others is now showing that what's here in the Red Sea is actually unique. Uh, the species that are here are only here and they're not the same as what's found in other parts of the Indo-Pacific. And that has strong implications for things like conservation of the, of the reefs here. What's here is unique. Um, entire you know, communities, it's, it's not just one coral that's unique here, it's many of the corals that are out there are only found here in the Red Sea. If you lose them here in the Red Sea or the populations are heavily impacted, um, they're not gonna come back here from somewhere else. Uh, it's, it's not the same species that you find even in the, um, just further south in the Indian Ocean in some cases. Okay, yeah, that was gonna be my next question. Are, are corals unique in certain regions? Or are they unique to certain reefs? On, and do the species go in, in other places? And you kind of answered that already. Uh, but the next question is, we, I know we've, we've been doing research where some of our corals are recovering quicker or they're not, they're, they are more resistant to bleaching just because mm -hmm. they're already used to the warmer water. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to take our species here that are adapting well to climate change and take them to these reefs that are dying. Exactly, and that's again one of these complications. Um, we don't know, and if if it's all one species that's occurring throughout the Indo-Pacific and just a, a particular population here that has adapted well to warmer water, we might be able to infer that yes, you can take take the corals from here take them somewhere else, and they'll also undergo that same adaptation. If what's here, though, is a unique species, um, genetically quite different from what's elsewhere, then that, that may not be true. You could take the, the corals that are well adapted here, um, take them somewhere else. They're really not the same as what occurs elsewhere, and they're not going to um, survive or thrive or, or, or um, adapt to that different environment. Um, I, again, this, this example of this widespread reef coral stylophora where so much work has been done on it. Um, and again, I think the assumption that things are surviving well here, we could move those, some of those individuals to other places and they would adapt well there. If it's actually a different species that's, that's uh, elsewhere, that uh, is not necessarily going to be um, true. Okay. You, all, a lot of this classification seems like it's, it's fairly new. Like you said before, they had already done research where they thought everything was kind of the same because it looked the same. What has changed that you are now realizing that they're not the same? I think there's, there's primarily two things. I'd say the, the main thing is um, our ability, again, to look at the genome. Mm -hmm. So it was only about 30 years ago um, that we began, uh, the, we, we the ability to uh, sequence a gene and look at the, the actual DNA sequence uh, became um, easy enough and cheap enough to do that we could start applying it to studies of, of biodiversity. So as we started doing that, first looking at just sort of choose one gene and compare that gene uh, across individuals, we started to realize that things that, again, had looked alike actually were pretty different when you looked at the, the sequence of a, of a gene. Um, over those three decades, that technology has just gotten more and more advanced to the point now where it's, it's very easy and inexpensive to look at the entire genome of an organism. So all of the genes that it carries or some very large uh, subset of those genes. And again, it's allowing us to really look in fine detail at how populations are structured genetically and be able to say, oh, well, this, this population is genetically 
very different from, from this population, even though to us they look very much the same physically. So that's one technological advance. The other technical, technological advance has come in, I, I would really say, um, imaging. Um, so again, early on when, when people first started describing species, the first corals that were described from the Red Sea were back in the late um, uh, 18th, early 19th century. And uh, they had very crude microscopes at the time, um, no you know, cameras to, to image the things, and our ability to actually uh, describe the, the physical characteristics of the organism and to understand them were, were quite limited. We now have um, amazing imaging capabilities, very high power microscopy, things like CT scanning is being applied to be able to image the whole skeleton of an organism, in the, you know, an intact organism. And from that high-tech imaging, we've been able to find um, ways that organisms phys differ physically that we didn't recognize previously. So what's happened in many cases with these, these cryptic species, superficially things look alike to us. We, we say, okay, they're all the same. The next step is we've, we've looked at their genetics and discovered, oh, actually they're quite different genetically and then gone back and said, okay, well, if they're really this different genetically, can we now find some way that they differ physically? And these new imaging techniques are allowing us to look at often microscopic characters that we hadn't, either hadn't been able to look at before or hadn't considered important before. Um, so in, in many cases now, these things we, we didn't think we could tell apart physically, we can now if we just have to know what, what to look for and how to, how to look for it. Okay. How big are some of these species? Like, as, like you're saying, they look similar, but you have to actually use a microscope or special imaging to see the right. differences. So how big are they? Um, they're very large. So okay. some corals are meters across. Um, and so the, the actual physical individual is very large. But the particular group of corals that I work on, which are primarily the soft corals, uh, they most of the way we tell them apart is based on these microscopic um, ele elements of their skeleton. Uh, they're small crystals of calcium carbonate that are embedded in their tissues. And these are, they're very small, uh, typically less than one millimeter in size, so you have to use a microscope to look at them. And we've learned, um, for instance, a, again, a, a group that we've worked on here in, in the Red Sea where it was thought um, there were um, quite, uh, well, a group of corals that were had been given one particular name. Um, we looked at these uh, little microscopic uh, calcium carbonate elements of their skeleton with very, very high power scanning electron microscopy. And when you do that, you can see very fine differences in the actual crystal structure of the calcium carbonate. And it turns out that there's one whole group of these corals that all have a unique crystalline structure to these little skeletal elements that sets them apart from all of the others and it's in agreement with the genetic differences we find. So again this was what we ended up describing as an entire new genus of corals based on a difference that we hadn't even been able to, um, uh, to image until quite recently when, when we looked at these very very small differences. When you're looking at the differences what um how different does it have to be to be classified as a unique species and not just as an abnormal, uh, something that's abnormal? Well, that's, that's the million dollar question and that's really the hard part about this work is um, how different do th two things have to be physically to be different species. Um, we know there's a lot of variation within species. I mean, we, we can just look around the, the audience and, <laughs> and know that. Um, but uh, how, so how different do th two things have to be? How different do they have to be genetically to be different species? There's no set answer. And really the, the definition of a species that's used by majority of biologists is one that's based on um, what we refer to as reproductive isolation. So members of the same species can mate with one another and successfully produce offspring. Members of different species can't. Um, so uh, that's really, how species are defined is based on this, whether or not they can reproduce with one another. It's how we determine that that's the, the hard part. And um, it's, it's very difficult um, in most species to, to really know who's reproducing successfully with, with who else. We've used these uh, differences in, in the, the physical form, anatomy mm -hmm. uh, of the organism to try to infer 
whether or not two things can reproduce with one another or not. We can use um, fairly sophisticated genetic techniques now to determine from, from uh, genetics whether two things are reproducing or not. But, um, but uh, it can be difficult to really confirm. So that's really where a lot of our difficulties in understanding are these two things different species or not come is it's, it's a definition def based on reproduction that's very difficult for us to actually um, access. What would you say are some of your biggest challenges in identifying the species? It could be whether it's something technical or it could be, it could be anything. What, is, what are your biggest challenges? Um, I would say for the group that I work on with corals, um, the other uh, thing that makes them very difficult to identify is they're very uh, plastic in their form. So a, a particular, a given individual even, can grow in very different ways depending on the environment in which it occurs. So um, I can uh, describe a particular coral based on its physical characteristics, uh, even these microscopic things. I can look at uh, the genetics of it. But um, if I take one individual and compare it to another individual, particularly if I'm out there swimming around the reef, knowing just by then looking at them, are they the same species or not, it's very hard for me to know that because one individual can actually change its entire appearance over, over time. Um, and this has been shown very, very nicely recently with some reef building corals, what were thought to be two quite different species, easily, easy, quite easy to tell apart. Um, a researcher in, uh, in uh, Mexico was following individuals over time, photographing the same coral colonies over time. And there was um, a, 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 an event, a storm, that changed the environment, the reef where these were living, uh, a, a lot of um, sedimentation which impacted uh, light levels in the water and, and things like that. And all of these corals that he was photographing changed the way they were growing and essentially turned into this other species. Um, and then a year later, they went back to what they were. So it turned out what had been thought was a completely different species it looks quite different. It was just a variation of this, this one species. It can change its, its form over time in response to even a fairly um, short-term environmental event. So I think that's, that's part of what makes corals in, in particular so challenging is you have all this plasticity and, and individuals can, can change what they look like um, in very short periods of time within their, within their lifetime. I don't know if your job is frustrating or exciting because it's... Uh... Neither do I <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. like everything you learn could completely change or yeah. it could go back or yeah. you don't know if you're discovering something new, if it's just something that's temporary. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. definitely a challenge. It's fun, but it's definitely a challenge. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take a couple questions from the audience. Does anybody have any questions for Catherine? Okay. The people are still coming in. Tell me a little bit about, uh, oh wait. I'd like to ask, uh, is the unique species, is the endemic species, or uh, should be the same? Um, so is a, is, a unique, is a unique species the same thing as an endemic species? Yeah. Um, not necessarily. Um, so when we speak of endemic species, and by endemic we mean typically a species that only occurs in one location, uh, usually a fairly small restricted geographic area, and also it usually has evolved in that area. So the species, um, uh, a row speciation happened there, that species um, is uh, originated and is only found in that one area. Um, so that's our, that's our defini definition of an endemic. Um, and really a, a unique species because just um, can be well, in any, any species. Uh, again, what, what we're learning is uh, that um, there, there are many, seem to be many more endemic species than what we thought, uh, particularly here in the Red Sea. Again, these things that we thought were, okay, a unique species that uh, has a range throughout the Indo-Pacific, we're now learning, okay, that, that one unique species is actually multiple, more than one unique species, but the ones that occur in the Red Sea are not only unique, but they're endemic to the Red Sea, only found in the Red, Red Sea. 
Does that answer? Is there any cryptic uh, coral itself? Cryptic corals? Yeah. Um, yes. Um, that's what one of the things that we're learning is we have many cryptic coral species here. Um, things that we thought were uh, all one species, and they're actually multiple different species that, that look alike, and we had not been able to, to tell apart. So we have many, many cryptic species. Yeah. Okay, we have a question over here. Can you just pass the box over, the microphone box? So you said that uh, corals in the Red Sea had unique properties, right? Mm -hmm. We did the uh, sequencing for the uh, total genomic sequencing, right? And we know the sequences in the other types and species in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. So why can't we just, um, we can't uh, transfer our uh, coral to Pacific, but uh, we may, may um, make some genetic modification. Mm -hmm. We studied the transcriptome mm -hmm. and the effective genes. We have already the map for the genome. Mm -hmm. Why did you think about uh, gen uh, doing genetic engineering or uh, trying to improve the ones in the Pacific by transferring genes from there too? Um, I think people are, not my, that's not my own work, but people are considering that. Again, I think the, the challenge, um, again, some of what we're, what we've been learning is what people have thought was one, one species that occurred both here and in the Pacific, where we could take uh, the, 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 the adaptations of the, that species here, um, how it's adapted to this particular unique environment, take genes and transfer them into what would be the same species in the Pacific. We're now learning in some cases it's not actually the same species in the Pacific. So that may complicate any efforts to, um, to do that type of genetic engineering, or if you were to simply uh, transplant, um, take the corals from here, transplant them there, and expect them to interbreed with and introduce their genes um, in that way into the other, another population. If they're different species, that's not going to, that's not going to occur necessarily. Kingdom or microorganisms, we used to do this thing and it's successful. I mean, they have the same descendant, the same, uh, so close in the phylogenetic tree. So I think it's more complicated with the corals, but. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's more complicated. We have very long light generation times um, and things like that. But uh, as I said, there are people that are trying to do that. Um, in fact, there's a, a lab in the US now that has been using the, the CRISPR-Cas9 um, technology to try to modify coral genes in, in the field. Okay. We have another question on this side. Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, when you compare between two individuals, coral species, on genetic level, uh, uh, when you align the two genetics DNA, uh, mm -hmm. at what percentage you would say this is different between two, those two uh, species? Yeah, that's a very difficult question. Um, I don't know. Um, it depends on the gene, for one thing, because different genes evolve at different rates. So we would expect um, if you took two, two individuals, two uh, individuals of coral, uh, if you looked at a gene that happened to be a very slowly evolving gene, you might not find any difference between them. Whereas if you look at a, a rapidly evolving gene, you might find a large difference between them. So uh, trying to assign a kind of a percent difference that you might use for determining if things are different species is going to depend very much on what, what genes you look at and how rapidly those genes are evolving. Um, and are you, if you're familiar with um, the concept of DNA barcoding, which is a genetic method that's been being used for about 15 years uh, now, where um, the idea is that uh, all species should have a unique genetic signature in a particular gene, just like the, the product barcodes that you find on, on items in a, in a store. They have those little barcodes that are unique to a product. So the idea is that um, we should be able to find a gene um, where every species has a unique sequence of that, for that gene, and you can use that gene then to, to identify the species if you know you know, what, what sequence matches up to what, what species. Um, 
And this has been used very successfully in many groups of organisms, such as fish and um, birds and butterflies. The gene that was uh, chosen originally for this kind of global barcoding project uh, is a gene called um, cytochrome oxidase 1 that works very well as a barcode for things like fish. Most spe species of fish do have, different species have unique sequences at this CO1 gene at a level of about 2% difference is the, is the level there um, that's considered if, if two species have um, more than 2% difference at this gene, they're considered different species, less than 2% difference, they're the same species. Um, and corals, unfortunately, that has not worked very well. Um, corals, for, for reasons we don't fully understand, uh, these genes evolve much more slowly. So we have what we are confident are different species that have identical DNA sequences at these barcode markers. And this is much of what I've done in, um, in my uh, research recently is, is trying to find particular genes that we could use uh, as these, these sort of barcodes to identify species and try to find, again, some sort of a percent threshold that we can use reliably uh, to determine whether two things are different species or not. And it's been very challenging. <laughs> um, corals, are, corals are difficult. Any other questions? I have one more before yeah. we go, and, and then I'll ask the audience one more time. You're, you've been classifying all these different species. What would be the next step? What would be the next step? Um, well, I think the next, I mean, really, for me, the goal of trying to understand what these species are is to get at the ecology. I mean, we can't begin to really understand what's happening on the reef. We see all of these environmental impacts of things like bleaching. We know that um, if we look at a, a, a reef that's undergoing something like bleaching, many corals may be dying, but there are others out there that are surviving. And uh, we often don't know, for the groups of corals I work on anyway, who they are, um, what species they are. So um, being able to say, okay, well, this species it seems to be tolerating these environmental conditions and, and, and surviving fine or even thriving, um, whereas these other ones are, are not, um, is what I'd like to be able to do. And certainly for the, th these groups that I work on, I can't currently go out to a reef and confidently say, oh, that species A and that species B and that species C and this one's doing really well and that one's not doing well. So that's, that's really my, own, my goal is to try to get to a point where we understand these well enough that we can actually identify them when we're out there on the reef and be able to, um, to monitor determine what's going on, how, how different uh, species are, are doing in the face of environmental change and challenging, challenges and um, be able to predict how, how reefs are changing over time, um, okay. the species composition. Okay, any, one, any last questions from the audience? Yes. Oh, one more, okay. Is the bleaching of those sources uh, con uh, connected with the Zudan cell itself or is the bleaching process is connected with the zooxanthellae themselves or the coral uh, itself? Or? Um, well, the, the relationship between the zooxanthellae, which are these algae that live in the coral tissues, um, between the zooxanthellae and the coral is very, very complex. It's a very tight phys physiological connection. And uh, a lot of research has gone into trying to understand when bleaching occurs, is it, whose fault is it essentially? Is it the, um, the coral that's stressed and is essentially um, kicking the algae um, out? Or is it the algae that are stressed and are leaving the coral of their own accord? Um, and um, I think said it's, it's been, a, a lot of work has gone into this. It's been difficult to sort of tease apart exactly what's going on. I think, um, and it may be different in, in, in different systems. Um, but I think some of that uh, 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 what's coming to agreement now is that under, under these uh, stress, the algae may be um, uh, producing uh, compounds that are bad for the coral, that it may be toxic to the coral, and as a result, the coral are, are expelling the, the algae. But it's a very, it's very complicated physiological interaction that goes on in the course of uh, of the bleaching. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have for today.
Join us this afternoon at 3 p.m. when we speak to Gustav Palle from the Florida Museum of Natural History. And don't forget to comment, like, and share on all the KAUS social channels. See you this afternoon, and thanks for watching. Thank you.